Hi everybody, my name is Jane Hitchcock. I'm also known as J.A. Hitchcock, that's my pen name. And I want to welcome you to my very first True Crime Online podcast. Visit truecrime-online.com today. So, I bet you're wondering what I'm doing here. I'm wondering too. <laughs> but I had been given an opportunity to host my own radio show online and I was very very excited about it until I found out that I was going to have to pay 300 bucks a week out of my own pocket and I kind of cringed at that thinking I can barely pay my bills just like most of you right so I kind of posted about it on Facebook to my friends and they encouraged me to do my own podcast and instead of just doing a voice podcast I decided to do a video po podcast because you know you see the uh, face and it gives you a little bit more of a connection to me, I hope. Anyway, so uh, what I wanted to do was talk to you today about how I actually got involved in cybercrime. And it goes all the way back to 1996. It was in September, and I had just moved back from Okinawa, Japan, where my late husband was in the Marines, and he got transferred to Maryland, near the D.C. area. And I had published six books over in Japan and they do publishing a little bit differently over there so when we moved back to the States I was thinking well I'd love to find a, a publisher or an agent here in the United States and back then you didn't have Yahoo, you didn't have Facebook, Twitter, none of the sites like what you see today. Uh, the internet was basically in its infancy for the public, the general public. So I joined a news group because news groups or Usenet as it was known uh, was big back then. Thousands of news groups, you name it, they had something for it. It was one for llamas, beer drinkers, it was one for Barney and it was called alt.barney.die.die which I thought was pretty funny and there was a writing one and I posted in there and introduced myself and got to know some of the other writers in the group and one day there was a message posted in the news group and pardon me while I read it off my screen here and it was from this guy named James Leonard and he said wrote we have opened a third agency the Woodside Literary Agency New York must have a complete manuscript printed clearly advances by publishers up to ten thousand dollars and higher call the main New York office for details and it listed their phone number so I'm thinking well you know what the heck I'll call and see how this sounds so I called guy I spoke to James uh, was sounded very nice very encouraging I sent my proposal out and I was very surprised when I got an answer within a week and I was so excited I was like oh this is my chance to get published in the United States well there was one problem the agency was asking for a reading fee and I'm thinking hmm agents don't usually charge a fee they get a commission when they sell your book to a publisher so I posted on the group saying has anyone heard anything about this Woodside Literary Agency it sounds kind of weird to me and other people were yeah we thinking that might be some kind of scam or something because agents just don't ask for fees like that so we went back and forth and I had some writers actually email me privately stating that they had paid the reading fee and some of them went on and after you pay the reading fee and you send in your manuscript then all of a sudden there's a contract fee for a little bit more money and then after that if you send in the contract fee and sign the contract then there's another fee uh, one of them said it was for taking publishers out to lunch and basically this agency was scamming writers out of money and we all knew it and I was really upset and I you know I think I'm a pretty good person so I called the New York Attorney General's office and I asked them you know what can be done to get these writers back their money and they said well you need either a higher dollar amount or you need more people so it could be like a class action kind of thing so I posted in the writing group not thinking twice about it that if anybody had paid the Woodside Literary Agency any money to let me know because there might be an investigation. I started getting a lot of responses and I had uh, these writers send me the envelopes they came in, the canceled checks, copies of money orders, whatever they had sent to this agency. And in December, now we're going to September 1996, now we're into December, somebody began posing as me 
on hundreds of news groups trying to cause a lot of tension and a lot of problems. Uh, for example, they went to the alt.beer news group calling them a bunch of alcoholics and I'm an international writer, I know what I'm talking about and then sign my name to it. And of course, you know, a lot of people got ticked off about this because they're sitting here going, who is this Jane Hitchcock and why does she think that she knows everything? And I'm just going to go back to uh, my things that I have here just so I can give you an idea of what was going on. Uh, another one was in the Sci.edu group. This group should be banned. There is a great lack of gray matter concerning Sci.edu. This group has no right to speak. I know what I'm talking about due to the simple fact that I'm an international author. If you have something on your mind other than a vacuum and the guts for constructive conversation, I dare you morons to call me. This girl knows what she's talking about and I've just about had it with all your stupidity. They posted my home phone number. Didn't get any phone calls, but it was pretty scary, wondering you know, what's going on. So I had my other online friends helping me remove these posts or respond to them saying, Jane is not writing these. Somebody is impersonating her online, so please don't respond to it and don't get angry about it. So in the meantime, while I'm dealing with this with my other online friends, all of a sudden my email inbox got flooded with what we came to call email bombs. Uh, one was question marks, and if you printed it out, it was like seven pages. Uh, another one was the name of one of my dog's band. It repeated over and over and over again. And I'm sitting here going, oh my God, who is doing this? And they looked like they were coming from AOL.com. And it got so bad that I had to call our internet service provider, who was Netcom at the time, and they actually had to go through and weed out my real email from the email bombs as we called them and they were very nice about it and they were really good about helping me with the situation so you know it just it was crazy and it came to a head in January actually on January 5th of 1997 when after cleaning up all the other posts that had been forged to my name that all of a sudden sexual related or controversial news groups got posts supposedly by me saying usually the subject line was hot for love bites or hot love bites female international author no limits to imagination and fantasies prefers group macho sadistic interaction including love bites and indiscriminate scratches invites you to write or call to exchange exciting fantasies which was spelled with a ph by the way which drove me crazy being a writer uh, with her which will be the topic of her next book no fee or hidden expenses for talented participants. Contact me at miss.writing, that was the name of the group I hung out at, or stop by my house at, and it listed my home, my home address here, uh, or I will take your calls day or night, listed my home phone number again, I promise you everything you've ever dreamt about, serious responses only. Well, guess what? The phone started ringing. It was horrifying. I got calls from all over the world. I have one guy in Germany, I swear, after I stopped picking up the phone, let the answer machine answer, and listening to these recordings, and this guy was like, hello, my name is Dieter, I would like to share fantasies and learn English, and share fantasies, of course, here's my beeper number, my fax number, my office number, my home number, it was just crazy with the phone calls. And, you know, I did what any normal person would do, I called the local police. And I just said to them, um, I've got somebody impersonating me online in a news group called miscellaneous.writing. And the cop goes, uh, well, I can send a car out to you, but what's a news group? And I said, oh, gee, if you don't know what that is, I don't know how you can help me. So they said to contact uh, the state police. The state police were in the process of putting their computer crime unit together, but they didn't know how to handle it. I even called the Baltimore Bureau of the FBI, and they said they would get back to me. Well, that's wonderful. You know, here I am getting people calling from all over the world. What's going to stop somebody from actually coming to the house looking to share the macho sadistic interactions and fantasies with me? I was very, very frightened. So, I found out Maryland did not have a law. There were no laws in place anywhere in the United States, which made it difficult to do anything. I couldn't use the telecommunications law because technically it wasn't a phone call. So I got in friend with a friend, uh, friend 
who was a lawyer in Maryland, and she said, you really need to find out where these messages are coming from, and then you have to file a complaint in the state where they live. By this time, we had a pretty good suspicion it was this so-called Woodside Literary Agency, and I needed to find a lawyer. I knew they were located in New York, just outside of New York City, and so I went to the, a lawyer news group, and I just posted, if anyone is interested in handling an internet-related case, please let me know. I have no money. And this one guy, his name was John, wonderful man, uh, he wrote, he said, this is fascinating to me. I will take this on contingency, which meant that if there were any court costs involved, that I would have to pay those, which was no big whoop for me. I just wanted to get something done. So we traced the messages back to an ISP called IDT out of New York. My lawyer contacted them and they hemmed and they hawed and they didn't want to turn over the subscriber information. They said, we really need better proof than this. And I don't know why they need a better proof. But guess what? In January, again, they got their proof. And this literary agency began posting their writers wanted big advances, et cetera, et cetera but they made one huge mistake. They forgot to take my name out of the from line. So it looked like it was coming from me, <coughs> excuse me. And that was what we needed. And that started the civil suit that my lawyer filed. Once he did that, he did it under, it was James Leonard, uh, John Lawrence, and Ursula Sprockman, and other names that we found in some of the posts. And there's uh, then some Richard Rose and John Doe's. I guess you have to do that legally to cover any other people that might be involved. Well, James Leonard turned around, filed a countersuit against me, claiming I was stalking and harassing him. And come to find out years later, that's a common tactic among cyber stalkers. So it just started from there. Now we're getting up to like, you know, 98, 99. And in 1998, actually, I helped pass the first online law in the country in the state of Maryland. It was an email harassment law and after that I got involved with more legislation and I also started an online organization called Working, uh, it was actually back then, it was Woman Halting Online Abuse with a woman named Linda who was also a cyber stalking victim and when she later left the organization to become a lawyer I took over and we changed the name to Working to Halt Online Abuse and that was to help victims for free online like us so that they had somewhere to go to for help where we had nowhere to go no one to turn to law enforcement could help us nobody could it was just it was just nuts so as time went on um i got interviewed by the washington post baltimore sun i started doing other shows i was actually on unsolved mysteries and they were contacted by the Woodside Literary Agency claiming that I believed in ghosts because one of my books from Okinawa was called The Ghosts of Okinawa. And the producer from Unsolved Mysteries handed me the facts that they received. And he looked at me and goes, they obviously have never seen the show, have they? We do stories about ghosts and the paranormal all the time. It was kind of a big laugh. And then uh, there was one reporter who was also one of a fellow writer on the writing group and he freelanced for a lot of newspapers and he was in the process of writing an article about what was going on and he sent me the following email on Wednesday February 26 1997 as the Express was putting my story to bed that's a newspaper in Oakland California I was visited at my home by two FBI agents from the Oakland Bureau I had called the Woodside Literary Agency's number the previous weekend to ask once again for comments on the story. As I identified myself to the answering machine and told why I was calling, the squeal of feedback suddenly interrupted as a woman, to my ear the same one I had talked to earlier, picked up and shouted, fuck you, before hanging up. She was German, so that was Ursula Sprockman. From that one encounter Ursula Sprockman had, according to one of the agents, put in a complaint to the New York Attorney General's office that I told her, you can run but you can't hide, and had threatened to hire a hitman to have her killed. The G-men seemed to be satisfied once I explained it to them, gave them a copy of the LA Times story I had written, and even played them the tape of my only phone call to the Woodside Agency. Even the agent seemed to be amused by the sound of me asking a professional droning news guy question and being interrupted by 
Fuck you and a hang-up from Sprockman. Jack, and to think that I thought at first, what would the suits and ties in the morning, that they were Jehovah's Witnesses, Mingo. So they were threatening reporters. And actually, the, uh, the Baltimore Sun wanted to do a follow-up story, and they spooked that reporter so much that he called me, told me, I can't publish a story. They're threatening me. You know, they, they were threatening to get him fired and to do bad things to him. My lawyer actually got a death threat. He got a phone call in the middle of the night, and I can't say all the words on air, but uh, he picked up the phone. Guy said, are you representing Jane Hitchcock? He goes, why, yes, I am. And the man said, if you don't drop the case, I'm going to come and effing kill you. And my lawyer called me. He said, gee, I got the most interesting phone call. And he recounted it to me. And I said, John, are you going to drop the case? He goes, oh, heck no. He says, this is just getting more interesting as each day goes by. He was just the best guy. Uh, they, th These people just would not let up. I was followed in the parking lot. I worked for the University of Maryland University College at the time. Uh, I was followed in the parking lot by a car and the campus uh, officer tried to chase after the car and said yes they were definitely following me but he couldn't get a plate. And New York isn't far from Maryland so it was kind of troubling there. Uh, a neighbor came to the door and said that somebody I guess had gone to an online directory and found out who was listed in the white pages in our neighborhood began calling all the neighbors trying to find out our new unlisted phone number. They sent a letter to the University of Maryland University College uh, pretending to be me, claiming that I was sick of UMUC and they were all a bunch of idiots and I knew what I was talking about and of course my boss at the university got a call from the head of the school saying, hmm, who's this Jane Hitchcock? And my boss says, don't worry, we're taking care of it. And thank goodness I work for the computer department at the school because they were instrumental in helping actually identify IDT as the ISP. But they explained that everything was being forged in my name, which is really, really good. So came down to February of 1999, the Nurkic State Attorney General's office won their case because the defendants didn't show up in court, so the writers were getting their money back, or starting to get their money back, which was great, and which was what I wanted in the first place, and that was the whole thing. So um, two sets of lawyers resigned from their case. My lawyer was just chuckling away as he went along with all the paperwork and keep going, keep going. And uh, it was in September of 1999, the U.S. Postal Inspection Service called me. And they said, we want to do an investigation because a lot of the writers appear to have paid money through the Postal Service, which is a federal crime. So I was at this time, I was just like, here. Just take it all. I'm sending you everything. I'm so sick of this. These people are driving me crazy. And so they did their investigation. I came home. It was January of 2000. And there was a message on my answer machine. And this is word for word what the postal inspector left. James Leonard and Ursula Sprockman were arrested today and they're in my custody. They'll be going to federal court in Uniondale, that's in New York, where they will be processed on charges of conspiracy to commit mail fraud and perjury. And so I'm sitting here going, oh my goodness. And I picked myself up off the floor. I called the inspector back. I said, did you really arrest them? He said, yeah, they're right here. Do you want to talk to them? I was like, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to do that. He said, you would have loved it. He said, when we went to serve the warrant, they wouldn't answer the door and they had to use the battering ram, which I thought was pretty funny. He said, I'm going to fax you over some photos of them, basically their driver's license photos. And it was three people that I thought were involved. It was James Leonard, John Lawrence, and Ursula Sprockman. But he said he only arrested Ursula Sprockman and John Lawrence, or James Leonard, I'm sorry. And I said, well, what about John Lawrence? And he said, well, guess what? And he said, he wasn't even a real person. He was basically James Leonard and had shaved off his beard and taken off glasses and he had his own social security number, his own credit cards, his own everything. And if you want to take a look, you can see right here on the pictures, there's Ursula, there's James, and there's John. You can tell that that is James. So it keeps going on. It gets better and better as we go on here. Uh, they were indicted in February 2000 on federal charges, a conspiracy to commit mail fraud perjury and making false statements to a federal officer. It turns out James had a very long criminal record. They pled guilty in May of 2000. 
sentencing was postponed 14 times. All the writers who were scammed began receiving money, and I was just happy to see them get back. November 30th of 2001, J Ursula and Janes were sentenced. Ursula received three years probation because by this time, so much time had passed, she had heart problems now. So I was like, oh, whatever. And he ended up getting eight months in jail, which was the maximum, and three years probation for mail fraud. That was the maximum he could get. My lawyer was there in court on my behalf and told the judge what these two people had done to me. And the judge looked at him and said, if I could give you more time, I would, you know, what you did to this poor woman. So they were also ordered to pay over $2,000 that wasn't covered by the New York Attorney General's case. But, you know, like they say on TV, but wait, there's more. It gets better than that. My civil suit was finally settled. I cannot say what happened. James put off his health time because of Ursula's health problems. In August 2002, he filed in an appeal. He lost. He finally served his sentence from September 2002 to 2003. Plus, he had the three years probation on top of that. I found out from somebody that Ursula died soon after he got out of jail, and I hate to say it, but I did. A little happy, no, actually it was a big happy dance because of that. Remember, this all started back in September of 1996. The harassment online started in December of 1996. It didn't end until April of, 2000, no, April of 2006 when his probation was up. That's 10 years of my life that they took away from me. It was the worst thing ever. And what happened as a result was that not only... Did I start training law enforcement in the Maryland State Computer Crimes Unit was the first one I worked with. I actually helped them crack a case. I started speaking at conferences. From then, we added on a kids and teen division to working to halt online abuse in, I think it was 2005. Began speaking to middle schools, high schools, colleges, universities, because now you had cyberbullying problems, and especially social networking like Facebook and sexting was coming out. And it just is, the years have progressed, I have had no shortage of things to talk to people about or to speak to people about how to stay safer online. And that's what I'm hoping to do with these podcasts is I'm hoping to do one every week and to talk about something I think that you would be interested in. I am also going to be bringing guests in. And if you have any questions, I mean, definitely do this. Send questions to netcrimes at netcrimes.net. Or if you're interested in actually being a guest, I'd love to have you on. Just email me there. And we'll talk about various things. And what happened was I finally did get published. I got published. I was writing for a magazine, a technical magazine. And I was complaining to my editor. I was trying to get a book sold to a traditional agent and I was getting frustrated because I kept getting rejections and she said have you tried our parent company which is a publisher I said no went to them they accepted it and I did two editions of net crimes and misdemeanors and you can go to netcrimes.net and see what's about that and then just this January came out with true crime online shocking stories of scamming stalking murder and mayhem and this book and I'm not saying it because I wrote it. It was fascinating to research. It was amazing to write about it. But they are stories ripped from the headlines. You have the Craigslist killer. You have Phoebe Prince who were cyber bullied and bullied offline as well out of Massachusetts. Tyler Clemente, a college student, killed himself uh, because his roommate had taped him getting intimate with his gay lover. There are all sorts of things. The first online serial killer, online cannibals, and I mean this guy in Germany placed an ad online looking for someone who was young and fit and wanted to be killed and eaten. I swear, I'm not making this up. It's really, really interesting stuff, and I'm not just saying this because it's my book. And that's truecrime-online.com. And before I sign off here, I am going to... my sponsored by this podcast, Seacoast Creations. Visit jahitchcock.com slash Seacoast Creations or find them on Facebook and like their page. And it's jewelry, earrings, and wind chimes, gold-plated and silver-plated, 
filled with sea glass from the beaches of Maine. And yes, it's my company. But I figured I'd give, give myself a sponsor, my first sponsor, and that's me. And it would be nice if you took a visit there. And I am going to sign off now. And I don't have any super duper graphics or music in the back or anything like that. It's just you and me. And I hope you enjoyed the podcast and I'll see you next time.